Will, as a child, what was it then that instilled in you this passion that has kept you going? Well, I, I was five years old when the family came to Kenya uh, to make Born Free. And I have to say that I was sort of bitten by the Africa bug. And I think once you're infected, you can't ever get it completely out of your system. Um, because we, it was an idyllic uh, year that we spent here. I mean, a little bit of schooling in the morning, uh, wildlife, bird watching, horse riding in the afternoons, um, you know, mum and dad down the road working with lions, exciting stories in the evenings, um, Christmas round a Christmas tree in the middle of some huts with a couple of little lion cubs just to add a certain something to the whole to the whole enterprise. It was it was fantastic and I actually recall I don't recall meeting George in 1964 funnily enough even though he was around all the time I do recall meeting Joy who was only around very briefly and we were walking one day and this person's walking towards us and it's Joy with um, a cheetah cub and um, somewhere I've lost a little tiny one of those little tiny photographs uh, that used to take on a Kodak camera <laughs> of Joy with a cheetah um, so as I say I was uh, completely immersed in it and scooped up by it and I've never been able to well I don't want to shift it. Uh, Will you've come a long way in 25 years there's been a long journey and you faced many challenges can you tell me about those early challenges and what you remember about them and what you have to face today 25 years on? Well Born Free originally started in 1984 as Zoocheck and it was because of the death of an elephant at the London Zoo that we actually started, not so much directly because of lions. Um, this little elephant had been caught as a gift to the London Zoo by the government of the day here in Kenya. And um, mum and dad were making a film which involved elephants, so they kind of borrowed Poli Poli, which means slowly, slowly. They borrowed her for six weeks, made the film, and at the end of it they said, could, could they have her? And David and Daphne Sheldrick uh, said they could return her to the wild. You know, it wouldn't be a problem. But uh, the government said, well, you can have her, but we'll go and catch another baby elephant. So Poli Poli went to London Zoo because we, we didn't want another elephant family to be subjected to having a, an infant taken away. And uh, when she died, or when she was euthanized in the zoo, um, there was a, it was front page news in the UK. And we were very involved in that. And we all sat there and thought, uh, are we just going to be, you know, uh, a one-hit wonder, critics now and then we'll go off and continue with our lives, or is there something fundamentally challenging that's going on in captivity issues? Because that was the single focus at the time. We really weren't involved in the wildlife side of it at all um, for the first five years. We looked at the captivity issue and, and the big challenge at the time was credibility. You know, we knew nothing about anything and the then director of London Zoo said, well, you'll be a nine-day wonder. And I have to say, after 30 years, we're still here, and he's not the director of the London Zoo anymore. Um, he's a reasonably nice guy, actually. I, I kind of get on with him OK. But uh, the big challenge was credibility. So we began to learn and surround ourselves with, with experts who did know what they were talking about, and we wanted to learn from them. And then, after a few years, of course, the obvious question is, if you're not in favor of zoos, what do you want? If you don't want animals to be in captivity, what is it that you do want? And we want wildlife to be in its natural habitat. So we started to promote the keep wildlife in the wild mantra, which is our, is our, is our mantra to this very day. What do you think it is about your, the, the way that you've tackled these issues and um, the way you've reached out to people that's allowed you to have the support that you've got today? Well, uh, over the last quarter of a century uh, or more, we've, we've always tried to be extremely honest about things. And when we don't know the answer, we don't make it up. We, we genuinely say, well, we, we don't know, but we're as determined to always try and find out. So uh, I think the reason that people, many people from all different walks of life and various corporate supporters and partners have come to join Born Free in this mission is because we... Uh, they trust what we say. Not that it's always going to be right, but that it's an honest endeavour. And it is an honest endeavour. I mean, we've given up an awful lot of our lives to trying to make things better. And in very small ways we have. I mean, if I was going to say what, what are the 
are the bigger achievements of the last quarter of a century. I would say uh, establishing, helping establish a directive in the European Union for zoos uh, so that all zoos in the European Union have to be licensed and have to meet some kind of minimum standard. There was nothing like that before and it took, uh, it took 17 years for us to achieve that. Constant, relentless, gentle, persuasive lobbying um, for the animals. And then perhaps one of the other ones is uh, our work on uh, wildlife trade. Um, I went to my first CITES conference, that's the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species conference in 1989, which was the conference where the international trade in ivory was banned. And I actually remember uh, in the months running up to that conference collecting a petition from members of the public. And we wanted to get one signature for every elephant that we believe to be alive. So we got 610,000 signatures. And I put them in a car, uh, borrowed from, uh, literally borrowed from a, a hire company, and I drove them to Switzerland personally. And then I got them presented to the chair of the standing committee of CITES, who was the sort of the guy operating the meeting. Uh, I got them presented by Prince Adridin Aga Khan. Um, and I'm, I believe that that contributed to the overall decision at the time to ban ivory. Since that time, of course, we've seen a, a, a dreadful erosion of that ban, so that today things are extremely difficult once again. And we have to, you know, gather our forces and, and rearm, and we have to go out and fight the battle again. Why are we now almost, you know, back at that to the same era of 89? for the bigger species and some for the smaller species? Well, so the, the world has become a very complex and challenging place, much more complex than it was in 1989 when the ivory trade was banned. Um, and I think the problem with human beings is we have um, sort of short to medium term memory loss. We quite quickly forget how bad things were and we start to reimagine how we can start to engage in practices that don't make any sense if you really look at it. So uh, the Ivory Bank came in in 89 and by 99 we were back into trade again. One-off trade, so-called experimental trade, but it began a slippery slope that led in 2008 to 100 tonnes of ivory being sold from some southern African stockpiles to China and Japan. And now we have out-of-control poaching across most of Africa in terms of elephants. Certainly all of central, western, eastern Africa is under the hammer as far as poaching is concerned, and that tide of poaching is heading south. So those who sold the ivory in uh, 2008 and made some money out of it had better be aware that this tide of poaching is coming their way, and they are not invincible or impregnable. Uh, it's going to be extremely bloody, in my view. Um, and so we've got to fight the battle all over again, not just for elephants, but for rhino and for big cats, uh, the trade in, uh, in tigers has brought tiger, tiger numbers down to 3,200 in the wild. Um, and because they're so rare, the traditional Asian markets are now looking at lions as an alternative to tigers. So we have pressure on lions like we've never had before, exacerbated by decisions that some governments have made to legalize a certain amount of trade in land body parts. Um, we have shark issues, species that don't sort of sit comfortably with, with us. They're not they're like two big eyes and they look at you and you go, ah, you know, you look at sharks. Between uh, 70 and 100 million sharks a year are killed, uh, mainly for their fins. There's no sustainable shark fishery in the world. There's, there's not one that is actually certified sustainable. Um, people don't realize, for example, in the UK, people don't realize when they eat rock salmon at a fish and chip shop, they're eating shark. That's dogfish to you and me. Um, and we're wiping out dogfish populations. Um, there is a, a, an incredible burden that our species is placing on every other species and every other, every ecosystem that we all ultimately rely on. Ian Redmond, my very good friend Ian Redmond, um, Tells, us, tells the story of, of elephants in the forest. And he says, you know, elephants are the gardeners of the forest. Um, they, uh, seeds that pass, there are seeds that pass through an elephant's gut and that are deposited in a pile of ready-made manure that will not germinate in any other way. They are that intrinsic to seed dispersal. 
If you take the elephants out, the forest is going to start to diminish. If the forest diminishes, then the climate that the forest creates around the centre of the earth, which generates the water vapour that falls as rain on the grain baskets of Eastern Europe and the Russian steppe, will diminish and we will end up having less bread because we removed elephants from the African ecosystem. You know, and I try and draw that linear line because people say, well, what does it matter to me? And I have to say, it matters to us all. In 1989, when the ivory trade was banned, the sort of the market that we were trying to tackle was Japan. China didn't even feature in 1989. It was a non-event. It was Japan and the Middle East. Uh, today, Japan is no longer on the radar. It is China. And so one has to ask the question, why has that change come about? Well, you've had 20, 25 years of almost double-digit growth in China. Um, and what that has done is it's created a very substantial and affluent middle class. Apart from the billionaires that are created almost every day, it seems, in China, there is this 400 million middle class Chinese. And by 2030, Forbes magazine reckons there'll be a billion middle class Chinese. It's a massive buying power that will buy and will uh, buy to order uh, ivory unless we change those buying habits. So when you get down onto the ground here in, in Kenya, where, where we're working, um, what do the uh, authorities like the Kenya Wildlife Service, what challenges do they face? Well, they face the fact that the Kenya and many parts of Africa are awash with illegal weapons because of all the wars and insurgencies that have taken place. They're very cheap, they're very easy to get hold of. Um, that means that carrying out wildlife law enforcement has become dramatically more difficult and more dangerous and more sophisticated. Um, we need to help uh, the Kenya Wildlife Service um, fight back with technology. So here on this trip um, we've been able to buy and deploy with the Kenya Wildlife Service all sorts of equipment supported by Land Rover. Land Rover is our number one corporate partner in this regard and we are providing tents, uh, GPS units, binoculars, cameras, cold weather clothing, uh, all sorts of things that will make their task not just better but more efficient, more accurate. They, can, they have limited resources, they cannot be everywhere, so they need to know where are the hotspots and then drive their limited resources to those hotspots and deal with the issue. Um, and we're committed to supporting them in that. Um, we are an institutional partner with the Kenya Wildlife Service and we truly believe that you cannot solve it uh, alone, you can only solve it together. The contradiction between luxury tourism and the need to conserve. How, how can you tell me how those two can work together? Well, I think tourism, and by that I mean everything from mass ma uh, packet tourism right through to luxury end tourism, has a fantastically important role to play in conservation. Um, Kenya, for example, has 500,000 people employed in the tourism sector. Uh, tourism brings in over a billion dollars a year to the Kenyan economy. It's a very important part of Kenya's economic strategy. Uh, and I think by exposing as many people as possible, but respectfully, in other words, responsible tourism, I think if we can expose as many people as possible to truly the gloriousness of nature and seeing wildlife in its natural habitat, I think the chances are that those people will engage. And if they happen to be, millionaires and billionaires who come here, then they have the ability to really make a massive difference. I think that um, there is one multi-billionaire that um, I'm aware of who uh, actually went on his honeymoon looking at gorillas in the wild. Um, but when asked, will you help save gorillas, said, I think it's too late. And my response to that is, it is not too late. It is never too late. Um, people who think there is no wild left in Africa need to uh, wake up and smell the coffee because there's lots of wild spaces and lots of wild places, but there's very little resources to actually protect and conserve those for the future. And we're not talking about, uh, you know, the kind of money that the UK is going to spend on the High Speed 2 rail link, for example, 50 billion pounds. We're talking of a few hundred million dollars a year going into dedicated field-based conservation that would dramatically change 
the entire picture here in Kenya and other parts of Africa. What can the average man do at home? And what do you say to him to, in, in, to involve him in this conservation effort? Well, I, I always say that the, the first thing that anyone who cares about wildlife and cares about the natural world needs to do is to not stay silent. They need to speak up for what they care about. So become an advocate. Go and talk to your friends, your colleagues, your family. Make sure that people know that you care. And then become almost like an ambassador for that. Ask them to join you in an endeavour. And it doesn't matter what it is. It could be joining and supporting a wildlife charity like Born Free. And it doesn't have to be us. It could be any of the, of the good guys who are out there doing great work. So I hope it is Born Free. Um, you can adopt an animal. You can uh, hold your own event. You can do a challenge. I mean, I just climbed Kilimanjaro a few weeks ago with uh, 10 other people, all of whom completely went outside their comfort zone to do something extraordinary, um, to both demonstrate their support for us, but also to raise a chunk of money, which we will then deploy um, for lion conservation here in Africa. Um, I think we can all do something. And if we all did something, even if it was for just for one day a year, the cumulative impact of that would be quite remarkable. Your mother is an extraordinary woman. What's your message, in a way, to your mother, and, and indeed to other mothers out there, um, who want to bring up their children and the next generation? Well, I, I, I suppose I um, owe an enormous debt of gratitude to both my mother and father for deciding to bring us to Kenya when the film Born Free was made in 1964, and not leaving us in the UK while they came and made the film. We were very much part of life in Kenya while they were here. And it was that that was the germ that started my journey, my personal journey, and one that I've hoped I've passed on to my kids as well, um, that we all need to play a part in caring for the natural world. Because if we don't, and it's gone, it's not coming back. We cannot recreate. We are super bright human beings cannot recreate nature. It'll be a pastiche at best. Um, my mum is a remarkable person. She has more energy than almost anyone I can think of and certainly more energy than people half her age. Um, she is unstoppable, a force of nature. Um, you know, she gets up in the morning early and she immediately starts thinking of all the things that she is going to do that day. In other words, it's an entirely positive agenda. I'm going to do this, I'm going to talk to that person, I'm going to show them this because it's special to me and I hope it'll be special to them. Um, she's just been taking us around uh, here and we've been to see Elsa's grave and we've seen a little bit of her personal and emotional connection with the whole Born Free story, but from a different side, not from the the film side, but from the very personal side, the personal angle, it's what motivates her, it's what gets her up in the morning. Um, and I actually think, though, it's interesting, um, uh, sort of Africa and the European-American connection with Africa, a hundred years ago, was dominated by men, and now it's actually dominated by women. You know, some of the, of the really big names, the Jane Goodalls, my mum, Daphne Sheldrick, others, the late Wangari Mathai are the icons and they're, they're women who have a um, almost a more visceral connection as mothers with nature, nature and nurture. They want nature to stay and they'll do what they can to nurture it. And I think it's an interesting dynamic. So in a sense, an appeal to all mothers out there is, you know, allow your feelings to show and allow your passion to be revealed and do that with your kids and your family and I guarantee it will make a massive difference to their lives and hopefully it'll make a massive difference to this very, very fragile planet that we are all spinning around on.